All right. Here we are. Uh, this is the uh, oh, October meeting of the Collins Amateur Radio Club. I'm glad you're here. Let's go around and introduce each other. I'm Charlie, KC0CD. Oh, I'm Steve White, NU0P. I'm Rod, K0DAS. Dave, K0RN. Gary, K0HB, Joe, W8 0 Joe, W8-0-K-Y-M. Dennis, K-C-0-P-O-N. Mike, K-C-0-P-B. Dave, W-A-9-H-B-C. Tim, K-C-0-D-M. Vince, N-2-A-I-E. Larry, W-A-0-F-B-H. Larry, W-A-0-F-B-H. Ellen, W-B-0-O-A-B. Larry, K9HHK. Another Larry, K0MTN. Kevin, K0HZ. George, NG7A. L, K0HW. Agnes, KB0EHC. Thank you for coming out tonight. Okay, is the treasurer here? I didn't see him. So I don't know what's in the treasury. Maybe he <laughs> would, yeah, he's got it <laughs> headed off to Mexico City, huh? <laughs> We're still here in the White Well, there was about 6,000 in there last time he mentioned it. Okay, uh, it's been pretty quiet around the stations. I uh, haven't been over there much, so. Um, We'll talk about what's been doing around the station. The next meeting is in 2020, in the year 2020. Woof. How'd that happen? Next slide. How do we advance here? Oh, like this, huh? Okay, that's the list of, oh, yeah, we normally have a vote in October, but, uh, and so if you want to displace any of us, please. I'm sure uh, anyone would uh, love to have you help out. Uh, the, we need a station manager just to walk in and make sure everything's okay and we're not having a fire. Uh, in the uh, North Station, that would be great if somebody could volunteer for that that lives up there. Yes. Yes? Yes. You'll do that? Yes. Outstanding. <laughs> well, it's, it's not a terrible big job. It's just to wander in the station, make sure everything's okay. Oh, okay. Well, put your name on the list and you'll get the big bucks for doing that. You get as much as everybody else on the <laughs> officer team. Okay, uh, for N0CXX, there is a 160 watt two meter amp up there. It could be hooked up to the K3. And of course, it always needs to be cleaned up. And please, come and use the equipment. If anybody wants to know how to operate any of that equipment, we've got a flex radio, 6500, two displays, very nice and a K3 with an amplifier, a uh, ICOM, uh, uh, 5, 6, 856, whatever it is, with a 1K uh, amplifier. 756. 756 Pro, I just. 756 Pro, Pro, Pro yeah. 3 with uh, PW1. 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 Yeah, and so if anybody wants to learn how to do that, um, we have all that equipment up there. Even have some HF 80s if you really want to go back and uh, experience. It works. Too. Oh yeah, they work. A little scratchy on the knobs, but they work. Um, yes. How do you get there? If you don't have a badge. Or well, you need to talk to the president and he or the actually the somebody that's in the house, like maybe the vice president, and he'll ask. Yeah, Somebody you got it. Well, no, no, no. No. You can get a badge as a previous employee, if you, for, as a retiree, you may get into the safe system so that you can be escorted there at the 105, take you up to security, they'll shoot your picture and give you a badge. Charlie? Yes. Angus, if you want, if you want access, talk to me afterwards, I'll get with you. We'll just set up a time 
where I escort you into the building up to building 106. That's just so you can get to the security office and we set you up and you're set up as a contractor. And it's a special access badge and you get a one, one year, we renew it on an annual basis. And then you get a badge where you can come in unescorted. It gets you into the building. It won't get you into any of the locked or secure areas, but you can go to the amateur radio room right. and use this and knock yourself out. Okay. So get, get with me. The only thing we need to work with is I need to set up a date and time for you to come here, so I need to escort you inside the building right. to the security office so we can get you back. Okay, okay. thank you. Yeah. Right now, Chris is the one that signs for it. Tim used to, but he's leaving, so he can't do that anymore. But So, yes, you can get a badge. has a C on it, and you can go to the station. You, have, you can come in the back way up the 112 stairs, or you can come in here after hours. I don't recommend trying to come over during the week because the, it's in the back of the... Uh, conference room down there but you can park right in front of the door and walk in and just this badge the badge you get will open that door yes it's just come in on the weekends or after hours so yeah it's right there in the back of the Burlington conference room so we've got a flex down there we've got the um, Omega the Orion uh, that's hooked to the 1500 watt amplifier if you really like big stomp. Sometimes if there's a contest going on, talk to Chris and he can hook you up with the log periodic. You can't turn it, but he, he'll point it to where you want to talk to mainly. And we have a four element step IR. So got some good, good equipment. Just get the badge and you're in. Okay, thank you. Yes, absolutely. And down at main plant, we also have the satellite station which we have all the equipment to do that, just need somebody to, to volunteer to figure out how to have it all hooked up. Charlie? Yes? The, the two new items at the top I want to talk about real quick. And these are ones that I plan to do myself, but I threw, threw it up here in case anybody wants to jump in and help out, that's fine. We need the presets on the Alpha 8780 to be retuned. Yeah. So right now, depending what band you're in, you're, you're likely to get over 1,000 watts and you're starting to hit the grid current from it. So oh. tuning and loading is just off, is, is off a bit. Which probably hadn't been messed with in right, so 10 years. Right, that just needs to be done. Um, and one thing I've noticed from day one, since we put up that new vertical in the middle of the roof, we get a lot of RF coming back into the shack on that. Oh. So like on one of the other computers in the shack that had some external speakers, once they go key down, they start buzzing. I mean, you, you can tell. So, so we, can we put that MFG, you know, has 30 ferret beads we, on it at the antenna? The, yeah, so we, we can do that, definitely. That, that's not going to hurt, hurt a thing. But I think what we also need, need to do is check for that grounding because when they cut the hole back in the roof for us and attach it to the girders, yep. I think that's a painted channel iron that they Hooked it clamped it to, so we got a little bit of Okay. But, but the big one is the Alpha 87 amplifier, so we can get that one retuned up, so that's up and operational. Yeah, we'll work on the ground. I mean, it's operational now. You're just not going to put out a whole 1,500 watts worth of it. All right. Okay, so that's kind of what is happening there. If you're motivated, you can pick up any of those if you know how to work the Alpha 87. And you want to talk to this one? Yeah, I'll talk to you. Okay, I need a, can I use your mic? Absolutely. Gurgle, gurgle, gurgle. I need to talk at you. Talk to you. Yeah, talk to you. Okay. Talk to the hand. Okay, uh, we're. I was reading the ARLL um, QST, and uh, we uh, I saw that the headquarters had an FM <coughs> contest where they had it just between the members of the of the headquarters, right? And I thought, well, maybe we could uh, do a little different contest here in Cedar Rapids where we would have an FM sprint contest. It lasts for a total of 15 minutes. Okay. It's so it's like speed dating and ham radio. <laughs> That's the way I look at it. And then uh, uh, the, what is the sprint that has it where you change frequency after you do a contact? North American Sprint. North American Sprint, where you have to change your frequency after you make a contact. So you're basically, what I'm thinking about is having a 15 minute contest. You make as many contacts as you possibly can in that 15 minutes. If you make a contact, the calling station has to change frequency. Is this using a repeater? No repeater. Straight oh. FM, 
simplex. simplex. Uh, in basically, you use your handheld, your mobile, uh, your J pole, whatever you know you want to. If you want to get your beam out, I suppose you could do that. We weren't uh, thinking that anybody could use. Do we think that they could use anything they had? That's what you said before. I know. <laughs> I was Club Station that, has beams. Yes. Yeah. Club Beach Station can do it. So basically, we would pick a night. Um, some, <coughs> I was said Thursday night tonight well, for the club meeting. I used that as an example. And then somebody said, well, that's a club meeting. And I said, that's <laughs> just an example. <laughs> so basically, start at like 7 o'clock. Uh, and then we run for 15 minutes. Then you have a little time to tally up your log book or your, your log sheet. And then we get back at 7.30 on the repeater. And we get, uh, you know, we get your score calculated. So just wondering, generally, does that interest you guys? Would any of you be interested in doing a FM uh, sprinting uh, contest? What sort of uh, It would be, what I was suggesting is that we would use um, basically um, stay at 146 uh, starting at 52 and going up the band and and basically uh, stay in that and basically maybe up to what did I say in the meeting I don't remember what you said like 148 or something <coughs> go up the simplex channel so you get to the repeated frequency right. okay. yeah basically before you hit the figure we'll not breaking one yeah one yeah, I, I'll basically, it you know, would basically try to narrow the band of frequencies you can use because I really want you to have QRM and QR, you know, get, you know, basically people conflicting with each other, you know? Can you reuse your channel? Yeah. Okay. I mean, anybody, basically, once you made a contact, though, you have to rotate off if you're the calling station. So. Does anybody understand it? I mean, I was going to write the rules up a little better. Steve keeps pinging me to write the rules up. I just didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah, but I was just trying to say, would you guys be interested in doing that? I'm not trying to put something together that is cumbersome, but just try to have some fun on the air. A comment? Now, this would be not just this club, but CBAR yeah. as well. I mean, we want as many people as possible yeah. to participate in this. Yeah, so it is no it's, it's just... Uh, uh, it's an easy thing to do. It's not a long contest. Uh, you know, Mike and I have done the North American Sprint Contest. I like that because it's a four-hour event and it's quick and it's er done and over. It's not like a duration of a whole weekend. So it's kind of fun. You can do it at your home, home station, or your mobile. Uh, get out into a, an advantaged area, maybe on top of a parking garage downtown or something like that. Whatever you want to do, but that's... Uh, you guys think it's a good idea? I'll pursue it some more. In the power limitation? I I was saying 50 watt power oh, limitation. Oh, 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 I sold that bitch. Sure. <laughs> oh, what's going to happen? We're looking at 1500 here. I, 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 I was really trying to tell everybody that these should be five watts, but then <laughs> uh, that's like, you know, basically do handheld power. But I think if we keep it lower than somewhere around 50 to maybe even 30. Well, right. about 100. <laughs> Round it off. Yeah. Oh, we can make it like a CB contest, you know. <laughs> they use five watts, but they're really using 500 watts, like yeah. generating their own corona, right, Mike? <laughs> the, kind of the upper level for a mobile radio. Is that yeah. Like 50 watts? Is kind yeah, of upper high. level upper level of a yeah. mobile. <laughs> I, I, I get to buy a new radio now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's it. Yeah. So, anyways, if I did this, how many of you think would participate by a show of hands? It's short. So do you think it should be longer than 15 minutes? Half an hour. Maybe 30 or 20. Yeah. I mean, okay, we'll do it 20 minutes. Yeah. 25. Yeah. 25. 25. 25 minutes. Something less than an hour. Something less than an hour. <laughs> and then immediately that night you have to report. I'll open up a net and I'll collect the logs. Basically, you tell me how many people you contacted. I'm not going to do any log checking. That ain't gonna happen. It's Ooh. on your honor. So, <laughs> and then uh, basically you get the award for FM Sprint in town here. So do you play poker too? No. <laughs> <laughs> Good idea. Okay. And that was my role as the program, uh, not program, but activity director. That was my
my secondary rule. Yes, yeah, bring up Kim's talk. So if you got me, so you put this on one pocket and this in the other pocket. Yes. Oh, yes. What? Amateur radio COP, which is loosely affiliated with this group, will have its next meeting on November 14th at 12 o'clock noon in the 106 North-South Conference Room. I will be the presenter and I'll be talking about development of a 75 meter AM QRP transceiver. Q QRP? Yeah. yeah. What does that mean in AM? Uh, it's 5 watts. <laughs> We're talking real DX going down here. Okay, this has been a fun thing that I've been working on for uh, a couple years, a lot in the last year. Charlie has brought a lot of help to this thing. The hardest parts of this he has done. Um, I've done the RF hardware type stuff. He's written this software to analyze all this data. Okay. <coughs> SMOP, small matter of SMOP. SMOP has become a noun now with us. You know. Okay, so what I'm talking about is navigation with HF. And I have, um, I have suggested these ideas to, to uh, various Air Force bases, STRATCOM, the nuclear guys, and they're very interested in the concept, but they all think, oh, it just won't work because the ionosphere, it's just flaky. You, know? you, you can't depend on what it does. And everybody that I've talked to in the military has believed that uh, this refraction off the ionosphere is so variable that there's, it's really worthless for, pr for passing precise time or navigation in, in this day and age, all right? So um, we're going to look at what, what happens, and I'll walk you through it logically, starting with the ionosphere and then what we're doing with it. Um, we all know what the ionosphere is. It is, it is very, very thin air that, that has electrons stripped off of some of the atoms, so it's a plasma. And it's a bifringent plasma. There's a magnetic field going through it, messing things up. So what we care about is this the statement that the highly energetic ultraviolet and X-ray solar radiation, it just messes it up. And that's true. It is highly energetic. It rips electrons off atoms. Um, so we're looking at the effects of that. And I'm giving you almost totally measurements today. Not going to be a bunch of theory behind this. Um, I've set that aside. And so we're looking at measurements on this thing. So what I did is I wanted to know how variable is it? If you went and measured the distance from Mike's head to my head via the ionosphere, would you ever get the same measurement twice? And if you did, how big of an error would there be? What's, what's the variation if you start bouncing signals off this ionosphere, this floating cloud up there, this 160 mile up cloud? How, how, much, how much like the ocean surface is it? So, if it was a useful measurement, I could get something from Charlie's head and Mike's head, and Greg's head, and I could triangulate conceivably if I knew, th knew those positions of those, of those stations, and, and I would figure out where I'm at. So it's conceivable you could navigate. Um, now, by the way, nobody has done what I am talking about today, all right? This, this is new news. Nobody has done this. They've done a bunch of different things using Adcock stations during the war to get uh, um, direction with amplitude and or phase, but they have not done this, okay? So this, this is new stuff. Now, um, the real issue is the cloud on the right. The refraction height does change as a function of frequency. To generalize, um, and you can look at vocab and look how it predicts, you will see that if the frequency is lower, the refraction later in the ionosphere is lower. And you go higher in frequency, it, go, it goes higher. It penetrates higher in the ionosphere before it refracts down. So what's so the difference between refraction and reflection? A great deal. Sporadic E is a reflection. It actually bounces off like a piece of aluminum. It's rare. Um, but in this case, we have a bifringent plasma. So what it does is a planar signal goes up, and it, it's, it's influenced by the magnetic field, which causes it to rotate. and It'll, it'll refract down. Refracting is a prism, prismatic, it's an optical phrase. So what happens is you have 
this, uh, this, this spreading of a signal as it comes down. And because of the magnetic field, it, there's, there's two refraction layers. It's bifringent. There's two indices of refraction in the ionosphere. So you have a right-hand circular polarized wave coming down. It's elliptical, actually. And a left-hand circular polarized wave coming down. And if the frequency is very low, they're coming down at different locations. Different locations. Larry? It is. It is. It is yes. Mm -hmm. It's a lensing effect. Yes. So the signal is modified. The signal is definitely modified. What you send up is not what you get down, and unless you're on the the magnetic equator of the Earth, the best path for me to talk to you is never the best frequency for you to talk back to me on. It never is, unless you're on the magnetic equator. Larry. Okay. All right, so the idea of triangulating via HF is not nearly in the same category of, as line of sight anything. Line of sight comm, line of sight GPS, I mean your line of sight of the satellites. So we have a lot more variables and they're complex and they change. So it's a non-trivial problem, all right? So we'll talk about, um, if you're gonna do this, these are what you'd need to know about the system, meaning the transmitters and receivers. So you want to find a beyond line of sight HF source that's transmitting from a known location just to prove out that it's physically possible. It needs to broadcast at a known time. I need to know when it's going to do it. Uh, a known modulation format so I can analyze it. And I want multiple frequencies so I can characterize what the, what the spectrum's doing. And because at night, one frequency doesn't work. In the daytime, it does. So you need mul multiple spectrums. Multiple locations to do, loca uh, to do um, navigation. And there are choices. Without doing anything extra, you can listen to WWV Colorado, WWVH in uh, Hawaii, and then CHU up just outside of Ottawa, Canada. So I'm not going to go into this. This is the format that WWV broadcasts in. The other stations transmit in a different format. But if you, if you uh, take all those drawings and reduce it down to words, it's interesting and it's kind of fun, all right? You get this tick when you listen to it once a second, and each tick, tick is only five cycles wide. It's five cycles of a one kilohertz tone, and it's AM modulated. So there's no phase, it's, it's the amplitude of the carrier, right? You don't have to have it tuned right. You don't have to have it tuned right, it, it's AM. Um, to make the tick stand out more, there's lots of things being transmitted. It's like a bagpipe where there's a drone in the background. Most of the time WWV is transmitting, there's this tone in the background. But uh, before the one second mark happens, um, it's a 40 millisecond wide thing. So for 10 milliseconds before the absolute second, which is an atomic standard, they shut off all these goofy tones they transmit and there's dead silence. There's, no, there's nothing being transmitted, no, no other modulation. And then you get these five cycles and then there's 25 milliseconds after it. So 10 cycles before and 25 afterwards, completely dead. There's no modulation. It's easy to look for that, those five cycles. Now, 29 and 59, they're missing. They don't have tone. They don't transmit those ticks. So in a minute, you only get 58. Now, um, the one minute, oh, I've got it up there. The one minute is special. It's not five cycles long. It's 800 cycles long. So you get this great, big, long tone saying, that's the minute marker. So you know where you are when you're looking at data. Um, anyway, and the hour is 1,500 hertz. They use a different frequency. So this is real data over the air. It's 8 o'clock at night. So gray line has happened. It's, it's swept over us. 10 megahertz is beginning to get noisy. It's crummy. It's not very good. 5 meg, I'm running 10. 5 and 2.5 and is green, OK? So these are three frequencies, three identical receivers listening to, to AM. And I'll, I'll blow this picture up here now. And you'll see, here's what 10 megahertz looks like. It's really nasty. This is, so this is 8 o'clock at night, so it's fading away pretty badly. Um, here's 5 meg, and 2.5 and meg is looking very nice. Same signal, same cable. Uh, it's an OCDF antenna, off-center fed dipole. Uh, is, is what's feeding this, this, these three receivers. Now, um, so now if you zoom in more, no I don't, I, I go, yeah, I go back to 5, to 5.30 p.m. before gray line, the sun is still up, it's the same setup, just 
two and a half hours earlier, 10 meg is, is looking pretty, pretty good still, but look at 10 and five, they are pristine. It's like out of the textbook, right? A dead, a dead pond, you know, 10, 10 cycles of time, 10 milliseconds of, of silence, so that's atmospheric background noise, and then 25 milliseconds of atmospheric background noise. So what's the green brown square wave up there? Oh, I forgot about that. That is a reference, that is the one PPS output of a GPS receiver. So that vertical edge is within the satellite's toler the cluster's tolerance. That is the definition of time zero at Fort Collins, Colorado, all right? So if you look at that, if you look at that, if this was zoomed up, you would, you would see that that number there is approximately 4.2, 4.18 milliseconds. The propagation time from Fort Collins, Colorado to here. At HF. At HF, right. At, at this frequency, right? Because it does change some Why with different like frequencies. 10 has more cycles than the 5. Um, the 15 has more You cycles. get really interesting things happening during gray line. During gray line, what happens is there's, there's phenomena in the ionosphere that ring and stretch it. It happens. Moreover, if you wait a little bit, this thing will disappear and it will reappear over here 20 milliseconds later. What's happening? Long path. It's coming around the world the other direction. And that confused me for quite a while. How? I'm not any closer or farther away, but it appears over here. And it's pretty good. But it's got, you know, a bunch of hops on it. And uh, yes, it's going around the Earth backwards. Happens every night. Happens every night. All right. So let's blow this up some more. So you see 15, 10, and 5 megahertz. Here's the leading, the leading um, cycle. It always looks this way a half a hump on the front end, and then, so that's the first cycle right here. If you look at the top, there'll be six positive cycle, half cycles, and on the bottom there's gonna be five negative half cycles. So there's 550 milliseconds of information that are coming across here. So what I wanted to do was, here's the propagation from Fort Collins, that's the definition when it rises very accurately, and here's when it arrived at my radio. So on August 16th at 10.30 a.m. in the morning. Um, so I need to figure out where I'm at. I'm talking about navigating with HF. So I'm going to be using these measurements of how far I am via the ionosphere. Now, right now, I don't know what the altitude is that it's refracting off of. So I'll have to determine that. So <clears throat> this is what the scope is look, looks like when you look at um, an AM detector detecting the envelope of this transmission. So the big burst is data where um, it's saying what the, you know, at the tone the time will be, right? So there's digital data sent before and after, and you can see that, that it goes, goes blank. I've zoomed in on this one here. So I'm, I'm, this is the, the five cycle pulse that I've done an AM detection on, and it looks really excellent. The, the edge is nice and crisp and, and and rises cleanly, and it looks like I could quantify that edge very easily using an AM detector. So that's what I did, and it didn't work. It didn't work because when you look really closely at the accuracies you need to navigate, look at this. Here's the first half, half cycle, and then the second half cycle starting and going up. So you get this, and you need to, you need to set a threshold saying, yeah, this is where the waveform really starts. And that's tough because look at this real sample of data. That's bigger than this one. So I, I built this circuitry up, I, I optimized it, did the best I could, and I found that I was getting 80% errors. So <laughs> on the leading edge. So the leading edge is, is not good. But think about this. Look at the red circles. I'm looking at the leading edge. Look at all the rest of the cycles. I'm wasting all that good energy out there that defines where the thing is happening in time. So I threw that away, and I called the on Charlie. I said, I, I need to do, and I've simulated all this stuff before I went out and built the hardware to test it. Um, I said, we need, we need to correlate, correlate. So if you just take the audio from the output of the radio, here's noise. I mean, this is real data. All this is real. Um, uh, you, you get random stuff, but here it becomes periodic. It becomes the five cycles. And what I'm looking for are 
five cycles of positive no, 50. There's a hundred, we're sampling this thing at 100,000 samples per second. So we're sampling audio at 100,000 times a second, right? 10 microseconds. <laughs> 10 microseconds. So we're going to have, in one cycle, we're going to have 100 samples, 50 negative ones and 50 positive ones, right? So one of the problems with that, if you try to use, say, a Raspberry Pi and serially get a hold of that data, it's jitters. You can't do that. So that's why we digitized it and made it square in analog. And then I can look at that. Is it a one or is it a zero? So I designed an acquisition module that would take the software out of time. So his, the software he wrote all has to run in less than 10 microseconds, right? And it actually runs in about three or something like that. Yeah. So I gave him 100 kilohertz interrupt, not interrupt. I give him an input that's 100,000 times a second. And he rushes out there and says, is it a one or a zero? He stores that. So we're doing thousands of things. Uh, we're doing it really fast, and we store it. And after, after the, uh, the burst is done, he has what remains of a, of a second to go out there and mess around and process and figure out where it occurred in time. So this is, this is what we're doing. So you'll see the data here from these correlations. 50 up, 50 down, 50 up, et cetera. And it, it, the beauty is it's, it's getting 95% of all the, all the one second bursts. They all show up now. They all show up now with a remarkable consistency. Now, when you, when you slide, when you correlate, and you run a sine wave past it, what happens is the first time you come in, that when you hit the first cycle, it says, yes, some of that matches the five I'm looking for. And then as you move it more, when you move it 50 more, you get a maximally not correlation. You get an anti-correlation. Because the 50 in the front are ones, and now they're lined up with zeros. So what you do is you get an inverted, you get a negative correlation. Here's the first one. This is the anti-correlation. There's another correlation. Here's the anti-correlation. Now, so that up there right there is when all of them match the best. Since there's 550 samples across the five and a half cycles, the maximum possible would be 550, would be a perfect correlation. We've never gotten that. But we've regularly gotten over 500 when the noise is not too much. So um, that's what a good correlation looks like. Now, see, we're, we're up near 500. We're a little over 500 there. Now, this is noise. The correlations look the same with some noise because you're getting one kilohertz stuff. But look at the correlation. Random noise would be. 250. And if you look at all across this, we got some 300s and some 200s, and it's random noise. So we have to reject things that have a low correlation regardless of when they occur in time. This is, what is this? We have to throw this one out too. It is the minute marker. It's the 800 cycles of minute marker. What happens is the correlator slides across, and way out here, Way out here, you get a number the last time before it went away. And you know it's wrong because y you'd have to circle the Earth a couple times to get something that long. So we have software that looks at the data, looks at the correlation, and throws away things like second 29 will never happen. Second 58, 59 doesn't happen either. So we have to parse out some of the data. Here's where I am, 691.96 miles from their transmitting antenna. And this is what some real data looks like on a given day um, as far as what the ionosphere was. Because I solved backwards. I said, here's, here's what the elapsed time really was. And I know what my distance is. So the altitude had to be that many miles up, 178, which is just about what vocab says it would be. So the um, question is, how much does it move up and down over right. time? This is a graph of three minutes of measurements that, that we took where we have 240, 240 measurements, 179 of them are valid, meaning I took out the one minute markers, I took out the 59 and, and 29 second uh, bursts, I took out ones that had very low correlation that didn't make sense, uh, though I mean it's real noise is what it was, and when you look at it, it's not all that goofus. There's not that much ionospheric variation happening in terms of 
distance, the 900 some odd miles from here to, to there. So now when you, when you blow up just that top part, this is what you get. You get a variation of about 35 miles, plus or minus 35 miles. So um, if. So how much does it move up and down? And if the total distance changes by 35 miles, then it moves up the uh, cosine of that. Well, it, it'll be a little less. It, it's about a 30 mile number. But the, 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 what you see is that this red line is, <coughs> is simply a running average starting and it's 120 seconds long. So after 120 seconds, it's pretty much indicating what the, what the arithmetic mean would be, what the average would be for those numbers. And I'll, t I'll come back to that red line in a bit, but is, is the raw data will give you a number within about plus or minus 35 miles. Now, what's that good for? What's that good for, right? Now, I took this data, um, to Scott Air Force Base, which is where the KC-135s fly out of, okay? Now, and I, and I was talking to them about a nuclear event type scenario when they actually fly the nukes and the KC-135s have to go out and do their thing. And they described the scenario. It takes two, two tankers to help a bomber fly all the way, to, to enable a bomber to fly all the way to Asia, and two more tankers to enable the bomber to get back to, to the coast, right? So, if I was a bad guy and I was going to attack the nuclear bombers that can withstand all this nuclear stuff, I would simply EMP the Pacific. Right, that's what I do. And by the way, you can read this all online. Uh, there, there's not any news here at all. And uh, that's what would happen. So just one, one uh, 250 mile exoatmospheric nuclear bomb puts out EMP, you get a 1500 mile radius circle where the transistors will be popped. So let's look what happens. Remember, I'm talking about HF navigation. Um, what happens when that happens is your, your, uh, your bombers will splash. They have to have the tankers. So if you look at the 135, its cockpit will go dark. That is a quote from them at Scott Air Force Base. The KC-10, it's not just going to go dark. That sucker's going to splash. It's a fly-by wire. And when their mission computer goes away, it will, it will splash. Now, the brand new KC-46 that they're so happy with, it'll flash too. <laughs> it will go down. It's irrecoverable. Now, the two bombers, they will splash when they run out of gas. All right? So it's, it's a very serious threat. All right? It's a very real serious threat. Now, when I was talking to the guys down at Scott, they said, they said an amazing thing. They said, this is a fly-by-wire airplane. The throttles are even cable controlled because Congress wouldn't let them upgrade about 15 years ago to, you know, to electronic control. So they still have cable control. They said it's tough, but with two pilots, yes, you can fly a KC-135 and says we can even deliver fuel if we just knew where the bombers were. Okay? Well, when I told them that I could I could, I, could, I could tell them where a, where a B-2 was or a B-52 was, and I could tell them where they were within a 50-mile circle. Um, they said, oh, we can do our mission. I mean, it was goosebumps went down my arms because they said, oh, we can do our mission if we just had that capability. So plus or minus 35 miles is totally sufficient for these guys to save those bombers from splashing. They can do it, and they can do it with HF. And it's something you can put into a, a, an ARC-190. ARC-190 has EMP protection built into it, but nothing else than the Bowman airplane does. So you have an EMP-capable modem, an EMP tablet, put Charlie software in it, and some stuff. You know, have other stations transmit, like HFGCS transmit tones. And uh, yeah, that cockpit will be black. Th this is a quote from them. If you can get us within 50 miles, we can complete refueling with a dark cockpit. A little tablet. B-52 is over there. Uh -huh. So there's a real example on why I've done some of this research um, to support that, that scenario. Um, OK, 35 miles. Now, how accurate can it be? Those are raw measurements. So even with raw measurements and no filtering and no magic, no special software, no Coleman filters, it has a useful role. 
And the, the second thing is I'm going to talk about is what, what can it do if you look further? <clears throat> I showed you this chart earlier. And when you look at those, those running averages, if you give me two minutes, if you give me two minutes of data, one second, two minutes, 120 samples, um, I can work it down to where I can get a, a distance of one and a quarter miles. Remember, it's coming off the ionosphere, and the ionosphere changes. So for, for a period of time, for this period of time that I have measurement accuracy, I can, I can get down to about a mile, mile and a half, something like that. So you're saying within uh, three, four, five minutes, if you average what you get, that you're well within the limit of how much it can move up if it can't move up forever, mm -hmm. right. how much it moves down. Yeah, it can't. And then you can come up with an, an average for that location and for that frequency. Mm -hmm. That is correct, right. So it, it's a useful number, and it's a very useful thing. So if you look around at, I mean, GPS is meters, right? But the scenarios I'm working for are when there is no GPS or it's denied, right? Uh, which, which is a real threat you can read in the Wall Street Journal and any military magazine. So what, what could you do with 1.25 miles, one and a quarter miles? Is there any value for this level of performance? And I'll give you some. Um, Russian military had, there was a big NATO exercise. It had 50,000 US operatives in it, US and, and NATO. And um, <laughs> the Russians jammed GPS to where? They spoofed it, actually. Um, <laughs> where the people thought they were inside of a shopping mall <laughs> instead of out on the high seas. All right? Now, this is military, these are military guys doing this. This is GPS. It's not supposed to be spoofable. They appeared, they were still working inside of a supermarket, a, a mall. Um, the, back in June of this year, in the Black Sea, it was spoofed from shore. Um, uh, this, was, this was commercial GPS. It was spoofed. There was a bunch of tankers. There were some military ships in the same thing. But all these tankers uh, immediately stopped because they, they, they were told they were sailing on land. Right, that's what their GPS solution was. You're sailing on land. So they stopped because they weren't sure where they were. They are so dependent on GPS. Now, these are articles that you can pull offline. Um, Russia publicly is saying, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do GPS. I'm gonna wipe out your GPS. Because they know a number of our weapons systems must have a GPS solution or they won't go boom. They won't work. Uh, position navigation time strategy, GPS, we're admitting it's publicly it's not enough. GPS is simply not enough to fight today's battles. Um, this is serious, jammers that can disrupt uplinks and downlinks. Um, so it's, it's everywhere. And this is, this is kind of funny because this, is <laughs> this was in, in Hong Kong. There was a big, a big show you know, with ladies in pretty dresses and all these jewelry and all this kind of stuff. And they had, they had drones. They had, they had 46 drones flying, filming this outdoor event with all these, all these elegant type things. And yeah, mainland turned on jammers. <laughs> and all the drones crashed. <laughs> Some of them flew away. Some of them flew away. But, but commercial GPS, you think? Or you um, that, that I assume would be completely commercial. Yeah, right. So anyway, um, GPS denial is a real threat. So our solution is, is pseudolites. Pseudolites are um, a GPS transmitter that have other sources of information. One of them might have GPS as a measurement. One of them could be a star tracker feeding it real measurements. You could have um, maybe distance measuring equipment like a TACAN or a Link 16 that would tell you where you are. And then the, the pseudolite transmits it in to some poor slob that is truly denied. He's in the middle of the battle. He has no GPS. He listens to these pseudolites that transmit faked up GPS. You know, just like jammers and spoofers will, will lie to a GPS. You can, you can send it good, useful information. And, and, and it'll, it'll work. Now, so that signal would be louder? Oh, much louder than a satellite. Than it, no, much louder than the, than the spoofers. Um, it's, it would have to be or it wouldn't work, yes. So it's line of sight. So it is line of sight, yeah. Miles. Yeah, it's, it's a short distance. It's a tactical thing. Pseudolites are a tactical thing in general. Um, <coughs> they want to fly pseudolites and give them better range and stuff, but that makes them weaker, more susceptible. But the point is, 
And Farley Gerber is a Rockwell employee, he, Collins employee, but, and he, he makes these, he does this, he's the guy carrying the pseudolite flag. And I talked with him about this presentation two weeks ago, and he says, oh my. He says, we're kind of not really advertising this, but pseudolites have a, a problem. And that is, you have to tell them where they are approximately to get them started, to get them started. Because when, when you turn them on, they could be anywhere on Earth. And that's all they know. And they, they can't work the math around um, with all the Earth as an option. You, you have to tell them, OK, you, you're in Kansas, Toto. You're in Kansas. And then they can work it down. So we can, by HF, he was really excited to hear that I could tell him he was with HF, I could tell him he's within a mile of where, of where he's at. So he said, how do they figure it out? They don't right now. They, they tell him ahead of time, you're, you're here. You're in Lynn County. But they have no GPS, so they, have, they don't have Loran or any good stuff. They have nothing, but the, right now, the way they've used it to this point is somebody outside of the jamming has GPS, and they radio something to, into you, oh. right? So I'm a pseudo light. I do have GPS. I'm cheating. And I'm, I'm telling you guys, true position as a G because you know, the GPS satellites are 600 miles up and I'm six miles from you. Right. So I'm outside of the bad stuff. <clears throat> but if, if you don't have something that's truthful about where you are, you, you can't, they can't start. They can't get going. So he was very excited that this, this idea, this concept was valid. Um, <clears throat> one last illustration is um, a, a cruise missile. They have an INS that's small. They're physically small, so the drift rate is high around a kilometer every hour they drift off, a, a nautical mile per hour, excuse me. So I worked on that nuclear cruise missile, and it would go 1,500 miles. It used terrain contour mapping, which over the ocean is useless. The ocean is flat. <laughs> Much of the desert is featureless in terms of a radar altimeter making a track and you finding yourself with terrain contour matching. So. Um, but it didn't have, we had no GPS dependencies because it didn't exist in 1977 when I was working on it. Now, this thing, this is a Calcum, which is a, which is a conventional warhead air launch cruise missile. That's a nuclear weapon. This one's a conventional warhead. And look at all the red circles. It's newer, nifty, and is completely dependent on GPS. It can't do anything without GPS. It'll fly for three hours. And it will not be able to find its target because it will have drifted off too far. If, however, it had an HF link on it that was doing HF navigation and could integrate every second a new piece of data into a Kalman filter, when it arrived after flying for 1,500 miles, it would know within less than a mile of where it was, and it would find its target. The, you know, the, the, the acquisition radar it only covers a certain window. It can only look so broad. So here's a real example of where HF is, is modern, it's state of the art, and it's wickedly difficult to jam these kind of things. Um, because I'm looking at multiple frequencies coming in from different places, and it's very relevant for tomorrow. And it's HF, it's the stuff we play with, and it's fun. So what is next? The what is next is, um, let me show you this thing. This is a picture of what I have in my hand here, plugged onto the back of a of a, an Arduino, a fast Arduino, 200 meg processor card. That's what we took. This, we built this. I built this thing. I designed this part, and Charlie wrote the software. Uh, he did the hard part. Um, 100 kilohertz sample clock I mentioned, one pulse GPS for reference, audio from the TS440. Obviously, when, when we get done characterizing it, we will unplug the GPS, bring this thing up cold, and say, OK, where am I? And the software will find it find where you are um, with multiple receivers. Now, <clears throat> um, let's see. Now, <laughs> I need to collect a lot of data on a lot of parameters to characterize the ionosphere. Because what I have talked to you about is, where's my curve at? What I've talked, I'll, I'll talk about this in a minute. Let, let me talk about, th this is data we took yesterday. So up to this point, I have taken data. I have stored it. I have post-time processed it with, um, with either um, Excel type functions or with a program one of my colleagues at work has written to post time process and, and make these statistical things. 
this, this one here is important. OK, look at the, the red line is the correlation. Remember I said 550 samples across? If you look at the top, where it is most of the time is about 530, something like that. So it's not getting to 550 because we have real noise. I'm, this is real data we took last night um, at, uh, I don't know, 8 o'clock or something like that on 10 megahertz on 5. Where were we? Ten, 5. Or five, yeah. meg? 5 meg. And um, so if you look at it, there are some things that, that fall apart. And right here is one. The, the blue line is not the amount of things that correlate. They are the amount of time from one PPS to where the correlation occurred, OK? So in time, there's two dimensions here. In time, this thing uh, correlated way out here in time, 43 counts. Add, add, add 400 to everything here. So it's 442 counts in from the one PPS. But look at the red line. The red line is the correlation. The correlation dropped. It was a terrible correlation. That was very bad data. So the red line is so important because it tells you how good, it's a measurement of how good the data is. The correlation was terrible. And the reason it was terrible, it's the one minute mark. <laughs> it's the one minute mark. And here is another piece of something that had a very terrible correlation. So this should be thrown out. This has to be thrown out. This has to be thrown out. We know they're not right because of where they occur in time. Now, if you look at the blue line, the blue line is um, the, uh, the time of arrival. And it's hovering about this, about this point of about 38, something like that. So 438 samples after one PPS. By the way, that's, that is how far we are from Fort Collins, Colorado. 4.38 milliseconds from Fort Collins, Colorado. Yeah. So if you blow up, if you throw out those big peaks that I told you, because they're, they're wildly wrong and the correlations are terrible, this is what you get. You get a deviation of, I don't know, 5 to minus 10. And this is in microseconds. A mile is five microseconds. So look at this. This is a mile. This is a mile. This is two miles. That's pretty good. That's raw data. So it's better than the data I showed you before. This is, this is at night. The other one was in the daytime. There's less variation. This is very smooth data. So the reason we need to collect a lot of data on a lot of frequencies is that it changes with time of day. Vocap predicts that. Vocap does. So here are some measurements. I, I, I didn't stay up all night, but I got, I got up at night to do it <laughs> um, at 3 in the morning. Um, so this is, this is the same frequency, same setup. Didn't even turn it off. So what happens is this is the refraction altitude in the ionosphere. So unless you've characterized it for an area, now remember, Brazil's going to be different than the US. Brazil has different ionospheric characteristics. It's in a different part of the mag magnetosphere down there. So we're talking about a lot of data would have to be collected. And this is one frequency in one location. So to make, to make a good technical write-up to show the possibilities, um, the intent is to run this thing for a year on five different frequencies in the HF band, and then boil it all down into um, a, a map so that when I don't have one PPS GPS available, when GPS is gone, I can take my database for this area of the world, between Colorado and here and Ottawa and here, <coughs> and I could tell you from, now these measurements are very repeatable, very repeatable for the last two months. I've been checking this. For the last two months, they're very repeatable. Now, in January, January's probably not going to be like August, right? because the ionosphere is not heated up so much during the day, and the nights are long, the darker periods are longer. So it'll be different. It's probably going to be shifted down. So I need, I need monthly maps, like vocap uses monthly maps, and as a function of frequency, multiple curves. And then when that's done, I should be able to throw GPS away and say, what day is it? It's Christmas Day. I go to my, my, my December map, get the frequency, get the curve for that, measure what it is, and I should be able to tell you where I'm at. So that's what's happening. So questions? 
In the back, Al. Absolutely, you bet. There's, there's, there's parameters and parameters and parameters. And right now, this is for a smooth sunspot number of 12. <laughs> and it's going to be 80, you know, so in six years. So, question? Would a uh, worldwide setup involve placing several WWDs throughout the world? Well, um, Yes, because WWVH, I can hear it, it's weak. I can get some data off it, but that's a long shot for HF, 5,000 watt transmitter. So yeah, this thing is probably good for, I don't know, 2,000 miles. That's my guess on how far I can go with this data, a radius or something like that. Now, when you go that far, you, you need to watch what the magnetic thing is doing. If I'm going east and west, that's probably valid. If I went 2,000 miles south, yeah, I think I'm into a different region, and I'd have different properties down there. So obviously this is way bigger than what I'm doing, but I'm laying a foundation of, of something to show that it's credible if you put in the homework to figure it out. Uh, still? Well, then that also means uh, for the military, for a worldwide uh, operation, ah. then they need to characterize various segments of the world mm -hmm. Right, but between ERIC transmitters and HFGCS and the COSA network, um, the, the military has a lot of HF transmitters available to transmit time markers. Not every second, but every 20 seconds or 30 minutes. Or, you know, they can do this. They can transmit stuff. And because almost all the time we're not fighting wars uh, with HFGCS, specifically nuclear wars, it can be characterized. We have time to characterize it. So if the, if the, the resources are there if they, if they believe the idea and if they're serious about operating with no GPS and GPS denied, the resources are there. They can do it. It's a matter of programming. It's a smop. It's, Mike? Yeah. It sounds like, and correct me if I'm wrong here, okay, so say you can collect all this data, you still need, as Rodney was mentioning, fixed site locations or locations that you know about. Mm -hmm generate these beacons. So what right. you've done is you've taken GPS and put the satellites on the ground. Yeah, of course. That's and, exactly and, what I've done. Right. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, That's true. Yeah. Now, the beacons would not transmit, in the military mode, they would not transmit signals you could hear, really. You would actually transmit a, a transect PN code that would be down in the noise. It would be difficult so to find. What you're doing, let's see if I can think through this, is that you still have your targets that just may be harder to find. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I mean, WMT be a good example. You would put a transect code and transmit it as a subcarrier on WMT. And unless you knew what you were looking for and had the codes of the day, you wouldn't see it. But that implies that in, in foreign countries, you also have access to some sort of... Yeah, you'd have to have... Put, put a mobile station up mm -hmm. somewhere. Right. Within the U.S., it's not a big deal. We have our own right. resources. I think you'd have to be within 2,000 miles. Really, See, right? that's it's very similar to the Loran system, Loran C that I used down toward Antarctica uh, 40 years ago, which is had long been decommissioned. Yeah, look, Loran was uh, oh, is it? wave, and yeah, you still okay. have to characterize the between True. the dielectric constant between water and uh, yeah, there was low and 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 Yeah, that yeah. was the same. And they were two what? Two hundred kilohertz, well. yeah, something the like that. Mega system. That was plus or minus <coughs> 10. The omegas were plus or minus 10. Yeah. Back to Rob? Aren't, aren't you also still susceptible to spoofing and jamming? Sure, that's why you'd have to have transect. Well, what was the question? Well, that's why susceptible. susceptible. Everything I've said is susceptible to spoofing. That's why in a military system, you wouldn't use a simple yeah. thing like WWV does. You would use a transect code, a crypto type 1 derived transect sequence that was transmitted once and never repeated. You'd have to do that. Yeah. Jamming is Jamming is an issue, right? That's why you need a multiplicity of transmitters and different frequencies. There is. <laughs> yeah. Al? You were trying to say earlier that the tankers over the Pacific would have an advantage if they could do this HF stuff. But the scenario you set up would actually be a mature ionosphere. So that would not behave the same way as the data that you've collected. Um, you're right. <coughs> and um, this I can't go into. Um, I have looked at the Starfish Prime data for nuclear simulation and what happened specifically in the HF band during that time. And um, I have data that shows that 
this will work usefully for the military, and I've presented that to Stratcom. And they, I went into a skeptical audience. Uh, one of the gals, a PhD a nuclear physicist, she walked in and she says, now do not use persistence and HF in the same sentence with me. I'll walk out. She's pretty hostile. And I very carefully, <laughs> for some reason. <laughs> and uh, so when, when I finished presenting the concept, it was a classified meeting on Starfish Prime. Starfish Prime is a, a nuclear weapon that blew up 250 miles up, 19 miles south, north, 19 miles northeast of Johnson Atoll in 1962. It's the last time we have data. And it was the most heavily instrumented nuclear blast that we, d we did. <coughs> That's at the power company in Honolulu. In, in Honolulu, it blew out light. Yes, it's <laughs> non-trivial. Non <laughs> and it, it was wasn't planned. planned. It, it, was it was planned. It they was didn't tell the Hawaiians. But <laughs> right, yeah. Um, Do you assume we lose all the satellites too? What's that? Do you assume we lose all the satellites as well as ground or uh, China, China believes that that will happen. China believes that will you, happen. You don't believe that will happen? Um, I shouldn't answer that. Okay. I shouldn't answer that in this venue. But if that's the case, and there's some satellites that survive, why not take a handheld GPS, put it in the lead box, and take it on a plane? The issue is satellite denial. However, oh. it's denial, well, yeah. yeah. Well, what uh, to finish that conversation on, on the nuclear physicist, when I finished the presentation, she said, that would work. She was amazed, yeah. She was surprised. She had never looked at the data, though. Uh, 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 Larry, whatever your name is. I want to point out is that the denial of GPS is not too much to take the satellites out if you ionize the atmosphere. So for an extended period of time, the, the, sat the satellite signal will simply bounce off the ah. atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So that, that's what yeah. the denial is there. Well, I, I don't have any secret information. What I've got is that you can go out and you can read it. Uh, you, everybody knows what Arecibo is down in, in uh, uh, Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico. Yeah. They get this big screen, and they have a full sight on it. They move it around, and they listen to, uh, it's a radar, radio telescope, listen to, to uh, planets and stuff out in space. China has built one as big as north as uh, New York, four times as big. With movable disk. With a, mo with, with a movable full sight. So uh, GPS passes over every point on the Earth every 24 hours. Uh, what would happen if you put a million watts in the, and we can generate, Collins generated a million watts, pretty straightforward, in the bottom of that thing when your GPS happens to go over. The birds that happen to fly over would be, psh, taste like chicken, and down they come. They're called directed energy. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. They can also... protect against that kind of thing, but you have to design for it way back at the start, and most GPSs are not. Unlike so Arecibo, which is a radio directional antenna. That's right. And one thing under that, there actually is a limit as to how much energy you can put into the atmosphere before it ionizes. Yes. So the, the experiments that I've read about or looked at uh, said that it, you can't really originate at a real low altitude with that much power without losing an awful lot of it. It might end up being, being uh, maybe laser uh, type, not an RF. I don't you realize the Chinese, unlike Arecibo, the Chinese have made this an optical reflector as well as RF. So it's, yeah, it's in new optics. Yeah. It's secret. It is. <laughs> Question back there? Taking a step back before, the data point that you seem to use primarily, you would always look for those five peaks going forward. Are there any other potential data points that have what that bounces off the atmosphere that may be a refraction or some other uh, uh, signal that might be able to be used as well? Or I've done some double hop stuff where things have come from Hawaii, and you can see them. They're, they don't occur as often, it's weaker. Um, CHU up in Ottawa uh, had a different format, same idea. They put out a tone on the, on the second mark. So um, using WWV is just something that's in place right now that I can use to show the principle. I'm really caring about ionospheric measurements. An actual system wouldn't look like this. It would be a military thing. It would have cryptographic in, uh, protection and transect. Well, I mean, like, the delta when uh, frequency sh shifts when the bounces off the atmosphere, for example, would that be fairly consistent? Like another source that they need to use for, you know, just another data point. I guess it doesn't really necessarily give you time, but it appears to be potential stuff in uh, HF. There, there are better modulations than what WWV is doing. 
That's convenient, and it's been doing it for 50, 60 years. So I would not use this type of thing in a real system. I'm using this because it happens to be there. I don't know the location. It's precise. It's got an atomic standard. So it's convenient to demonstrate, here's what the ionosphere is doing. But no, it's not at all the right waveform that you'd use in a real system. Not at all. But it does have to do with the path as well, right? So for example, from Hawaii, you would mention. Mm -hmm. Right, so most of that path is over water. Right. So Which is really helpful. So delay on the, right. On the, Mm -hmm. That's true. Delay. So the path, what good is this for hands? Delay is going to be different depending on where they're coming from. Because you're just talking about one point. There's that's true. To, true. To but that's why you'd use CHU in point. Canada. And then you, you'd, you'd have two points of triangulation. Right. So. But uh, still over land mass. And yeah. Typically true. Typically over water. Right. Or not over <coughs> ice because then mm -hmm. ice. Is like different. Yeah. Delays the yeah. Yeah, um, you, you can't avoid it in these frequencies. You can see lightning come through in the raw data, and yeah, you don't get it then. <laughs> it, it, it's a loss. Uh, 240 um, seconds, I got 179 valid things. They were lost, and they're not just all you know one minute markers and stuff. They were actually lost due to lightning. Sure. Barry? Okay, so lightning. Right, it doesn't. It, data that. it doesn't correlate, right? Okay. The correlation coefficient is low, and it gets thrown out. Yeah. Comments on the KC forty six are alarming. I guess. So it's fly by wire and it's vulnerable to EMP. Yeah. Yeah, because the I worked on KC one thirty five, mm -hmm. and of course that was cable and, and servo, hyper servo operated, uh, largely all it's got some fly by wire, but the, the new planes are, I believe, all fly by wire now. Yeah. And, uh, but they're protected against lightning effects. Is just what they, they are, which is pretty good. Yeah, which is uh, pretty I good. I worry that you get enough energy from EMP over the ride, even what lightning would do. <laughs> so, but the Air Force is telling me that. Well, I worked, when I worked on nuclear weapons, I was working down for Boeing, military airplane company, in Seattle and then later in Wichita. And um, I designed stuff that went on the B 52Gs and Hs. Yeah. And we took them down to Trestle at Kirtland Air Force Base. And we zap those suckers, and to give you an idea, it's 50,000, you know what the numbers are, 50,000 volts per meter, and um, the, the inrush into the box that I designed was <coughs> on, on anything that wasn't a balanced wire, so a single-ended wire. It was 1,200 amps inrush at 1,500 volts. I had to withstand that. And the duration was classified, but nonetheless, that's curtains for a transit. That's inside of the aluminum tube. That's what was allocated to me inside of the airplane, <coughs> protected by the aluminum shell, the B-52. So it, it's not trivial. It's not trivial. Um, <laughs> Hopefully the KC-46 would have a lot of EMP hardening done on it, but they said we're going to take over that over with the DO-160 commercial requirements. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Those numbers were high enough mm -hmm. in the lightning world that the EMP wouldn't be that big of an issue, but it sounds like it sure is there. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was very surprising as a taxpayer to be told that. Anytime you have high noise data like this is, an inertial and INS would be, you'd have to have it. I mean, for, for short term stability. So a Kalman filter, an INS, and this right. should give you your nav solution. Because they would carry you on for a while, mm -hmm. but for a while after the EMP hit, let's say. Oh, yeah. Well, give you enough time to get the HF, uh, right. As long as it didn't die. <laughs> In the case of the 135, they said their mission computer will go south, mm -hmm. it'll go dark. Yeah. Okay. Was there a question over there someplace? Yeah. Dave? Yeah. Um, 
there's also the 60 kilohertz WWF. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which, of course, is 1 100th of the frequency that the HF is. You've got 1 100th of the resolution. Uh, but it also has a separate propagation mechanism. It does, yeah. That's less susceptible to variations. Mm -hmm. Is that of any utility at all? Absolutely. I just haven't gotten to 60 kilohertz yet. <laughs> I can receive it, but I haven't processed it yet. Yeah, you're right. It, that's on the menu to do something with. Anything else? I guess that's it. Thank you. I, I will tail geek here on this. We ended up using the uh, a thing called the uh, from Adafruit called the um, Grand Central, which is a variation on um, the Arduino. Uh, 16 meg uh, metro. Uh, if you go back to the original about 10 years ago, an Uno ran at 12 meg. Not very fast. One of the problems is, even if you use a, a uh, Raspberry Pi 4B, which runs at uh, 1.5 gigahertz. Yeah, well, he's. Go over there, whatever. Yeah. 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 Turn it on. 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 The, the problem is most uh, of the thought here, if you want to run a serial, or if you want to run audio, you want to record audio, you got to run I squared C. And if you see, uh, see some of those things, and I have a couple of them, they say, oh yeah, we can run 400,000 samples per second. How that works is normally you tell the A to D that you want data and it with an address and it comes back with the data. The problem is that handshaking back and forth is three times back and forth. How they get that speed is they say, okay, now what I want you to do is send me this many samples for the next, whatever, two seconds. That doesn't work for us because we need the thing accurate within a microsecond. Well, that's pretty much asynchronous data, which works fine for voice, you know, okay, big deal. But that's not what we want. So in another project we're working on, we want a parallel interface, a 12-bit A to D and a 12-bit D to A. Well, so that's why we went with the thing called the Teensy, uh, which is this size right here. It runs at 240 meg. Now that thing runs at 1.4 gig, but they bring out 54 pins. And you can put together 12 in and 12 out. They're not really in sequence. The uh, C register has 12 bits in a row from 0 to uh, 13. But the B register has 0 through 9, and it skips 10, and then you get 11. Why they didn't bring them all out at one whack, I don't know. But anyway, we worked around that. So that's what we're using for the experiments we're doing. So it's kind of interesting to see the range of how things have changed. About the time you get design, get something figured out and design, then they come out with another one. Right now they have this thing, which is running at 600 meg. And it's about four times as fast as this one. So there's a whole range of stuff. Like Kim says, you want to run a nail through this, the old ones. Hey, come on, guys. <laughs> Anyway, so that's, that's kind of how we've arrived at the point where we've arrived. You can't really get 10 microsecond sample consistent with a Raspberry Pi because of this whole serial thing. But with this, we can. Basically, what the software does, what Tim does, using the one PPS, I hang up until the one PPS falls. And then I hang up until the one PPS rises. And once it rises, that's the rising edge. And then I go into the 100 kilohertz signal and wait for it to, to rise. And then I start keep taking data, Five, uh, 1,500 samples. And once I get 1,500 samples, then I run off and start sliding a sine wave over it 
until we get the biggest number of correlation, the highest number of correlation that the SMOP is doing. So any questions? And look at the range of stuff I've spent money on as they come out with a new one. Well, I gotta see if it's any faster. <laughs> Sucker. Okay, thanks for all coming and hope it was interesting. If you have questions, bring them up.